I was skipping to the kitchen to see the apple bag Dad had prepared for my school picnic. Aw, how thoughtful of him. I excitedly took a bite, but it tasted like it had been left to rot for a decade. I frantically checked the bag and saw this was not the only bad one. Dad! Hey, I'm Doris, and things like this are an everyday occurrence for me. My dad's clumsy and colorblind, two contributing factors that sure make life interesting. Since mom passed away, I had to watch him like a hawk, else you betcha he'd mess stuff up. One time he roasted a turkey, but it was so raw as if it would jump off the plate and run around the house. And on my last birthday, he got me a pair of mittens with one bright orange and one neon green. I reluctantly tried them on, looking like a clown while people burst out laughing. Despite all that, he's still an awesome dad in my eyes. A super talented artist with incredible artwork, provided he lets me label the paint colors. And also a really big supporter of my dream. From the first time he helped me skate on the lake, I knew it was my life's calling. If I can be an artist even though I'm colorblind, how can just a few bumps stop you from being a figure skater? Bravo! I'll definitely give him a 100, except that he does have one bonkers rule. No dating until I'm 18! Whatever, it's not like I gave boys much thought. The only boy I spoke to was my neighbor, Ben, and dad seemed to like him. That kid's pretty good. He likes drawing and artists are caring people, just like me. <laughs> and he seems to not attract it to girls, either. <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but it's true that we can never be a couple. His mushy manner is definitely not my type. Anyway, it's super fun having him as a friend. Since we were little, Ben always went along with anything I asked, from drawing me a unicorn picture from my room, giving me his only ice pop, to more exciting things, such as knocks and runs, and covering the neighbor's car in toilet paper. <laughs> And now, he always escorts me to my skating practice a few towns away, and just sits there scribbling something until I finish. This whole month I've been practicing so hard for the upcoming big competition in town. I'm gonna bring a medal home! This is my time to shine! I started gliding, letting the rhythm control my movement. The cold, calming breeze pushed against me like I was flying. It's time for an axle jump. I sprang into the air like a cotton ball, but suddenly lost my balance and fell flat on my face. As a result, I was ranked 29 out of 30. Duh. But surprisingly, there was one judge giving me all high marks. Finally, someone saw my potential. I was beaming when this cute guy approached me. Hi, I'm Luke. Just wanted to say that you were absolutely on point out there. Oh, he's that guy. I really want to get to know you more. How about we hang out together? I'll take you somewhere as special as you are to me. This is definitely against dad's rule, but oh boy, his killer smile made my stomach swoosh. So I ended up saying yes. I excitedly told Ben, but he gave me this sour face look. Hey, your dad will not be happy if he knows this. Just don't let him know. Luke is an expert, so he can help me hone in on my talent. You will keep this a secret, won't you? So here's my first date ever. Luke was so sweet. He complimented my ice skating and constantly gave me these loving looks. Our food arrived and delish. Bon appetit. I daintily tried the mashed potato and immediately felt the delicious taste of warm butter and chives and something pointy. A hairpin? I quickly stood up, demanding to see the manager, but Luke stopped me. Babe, you found the gift I prepared for you. Then he grabbed the hairpin and wiped it on his shirt and put it on my hair. <laughs> Maybe this was a normal thing for guys to do on dates, right? Only his gifts show didn't stop there. Later I found a ring in my steak, then a keychain in my salad. You're cute, just like this Lotso. Isn't he the bad guy? But the cherries on top were the movie tickets in my sandwich. Luke, what's this about? I just hope we could bond over watching movies together. You hate it that much? N no, no, I didn't mean that. Think about it. It was kind of weird, but also the sweetest thing that had ever happened to me. Luke had a funny way of showing it, but he made me feel special and giddy. And maybe in love? Before I could think straight, he was leaning closer to me. I closed my eyes and was ready for the most romantic kiss ever. But why were his lips so hard and unmoving? What? The menu? And holding it was... Dad? You know this crazy old man? I am her father. Then Dad dragged an extra chair over to our table, plopped down, and started babbling on. Then, when Luke wasn't looking, Dad poured pepper into his coffee. Before I could say anything, poor Luke took a sip and spat it out everywhere. Mm, sorry. I thought it was sugar. You see, I'm colorblind, so it was an honest mistake. 
After that, he accidentally splashed the sauce on Luke's shirt, then grabbed his glass of red wine and poured it over Luke, saying he was trying to clean it. Enough! Your old man is insane! No one will ever date you again! Then he stormed away. I was furious! How could Dad embarrass me like this? You're controlling, crazy, and do the stupidest things! You don't allow me to be me, and you just scared away my date! None of his apologies could move me. I had the right to make my own choices without Dad interrupting and being ridiculous. So I used my savings. I moved out of my home to start my new life. This freedom was greater than great. I could talk to any guy and go on as many dates as I wanted. Only, I know there's always were extra eyes on me. Do you get the feeling someone's watching us? No way. It's just you and me. I've had a great time. Do you want to do it again? Ugh! What the fudge? If Dad thinks he can stop me by messing around like this, he's totally wrong. It did quite the opposite instead. I started dating loads of guys, even if I didn't like them that much. It was so nice being spoiled by boys, and my room was always full of their presence. I updated Ben all about my dating stories, but he just frowned. Yo, slow down. You want to speed date the entire town? Man, it's just dating. It's not like I've agreed to be their girlfriend or anything. But you don't even know them, or what their intentions are. My dad doesn't understand me. Why now you sound just like him? Fine, don't feel like you need to come here or give me rides or anything. I can make my own way to school and get my date to come with me to practice from tomorrow. I'm sorry, Doris. Ignore me. I'm probably just overthinking stuff. Yeah, Ben's Ben. <sighs> He's still the one I could count on after all. Anyway, being a serial dater can cause troubles. I muddled up Gregory's interest with Ivan's. And I forgot I already told Anton my hilarious story the third time already. I was late for my date with Hector because my previous shift with Ryan went on longer than I expected. Then being so exhausted from all of this dating, I fell asleep during my meal with Christian. Luckily for me, Ben was always there to help. What's up? You look exhausted. I don't know. Dating was fun at first, but now it left me no time to rest, and now I can't even distinguish those guys. <laughs> hey, what's so funny? Nothing. It's just nice not having to share you with an alphabet of guys. Don't worry. You're the only B in my life. One day after school, a group of boys surrounded me and started accusing me of being a cheater. Hey, it wasn't like I was anyone's girlfriend, so it wasn't classed as cheating. I'm still single, so I can go on many dates as I can. Only, my outburst seemed to make them even angrier. As all these guys shouted at me, a cop walked over. Hang on, is that dad? Hey, hey, you boys stop bothering this young lady right now. I just finished a karate class already. I'll give you a piece of my mind. See? Hiya! Hiya! What a bunch of weirdos. Thank God Dad came here on time to save me. But it's such a shame that he saw I was a helpless failure at everything. So my shame became rage. Who asked you to show up in magazine? Quit bugging me with all your nonsense. I can handle this myself. When I returned to my apartment, Ben was sitting there waiting for me. Overwhelmed with everything, I burst into tears. He pulled me into an embrace and I instantly felt better. But then... Doris, stop with the games and just go home. Games? This isn't a game. This is my life. I deserve to live it how I want to. You're too much of a coward to ever understand that. As soon as I said it, I regretted it. Ben looked so hurt and mad. He just shook his head and left. I honestly thought he was the one person who would never leave. But whatever. I didn't need him. Or dad, either. Now I had to prove to dad that I was mature enough to handle independence and could find someone much better than Ben beside me. Just wait and see. Told you. Now God bless me with this guy, Mark. A super strong and macho BF who was always ready to protect me. Babe, look out. What? Just let me handle this. Then he moved me out of the way and punched right to the wall. Wow, that's a mosquito. Thank you for saving me. One time, we were strolling through the school's garden when I spotted Ben. I immediately gave Mark a cute damsel in distress look and said, Babe, I'm so tired. I think I'm gonna pass out. Don't worry. I'll take you to the hospital. Suddenly, he lifted me over his shoulders and carried me off. My head was spinning and it made me want to faint. Literally. I begged him to put me down and let me sit for a while. Then, I suddenly saw Ben frowning at me. Ha, huh, seeing me totally fine without him, how can he not be annoyed? But who was that? She started staring at his art passionately. Then, can you believe it? She asked him to draw her, and he agreed. I can't stay here watching this ridiculous play. So I grabbed Mark's hand and pulled him away. But that night, I kept tossing and turning, and the image of Ben and that girl couldn't get out of my head. No, no, no big deal. They were just super irritating, that's all. 
Too many things happened, and now it's time for me to focus on my figure skating dreams again. With my sugar plum. As he went off to buy us some drinks, who should come over to me but my first date disaster, Luke? Oh, you're still ice skating. Just give up already. I only give you a high score so you date me. Don't flatter yourself. By the way, your crazy old man's still doing good? Shut up. My dad was right about you, you jerk. Jerk? Okay, this jerk will tell the rink manager to ban you from coming here for good. I stared at him, open mouth, not knowing what to say, when out of nowhere Ben appeared. I don't think the skating committee would be impressed by your fake scores, do you? All it would take is one email and you can kiss your position on the judging panel goodbye. How dare you! Then he left in anger. Right at that moment, Mark returned. Babe, skating sucks, just quit it. Let's go for some trampoline then. Dars, go practice. No one dares to ban you now. Who the freak are you? Mark, stop! That's Ben, my friend. Uh, no, just an acquaintance. Dars, watch yourself with that guy. It's none of your business. Let's go, Mark. Bye, loser. The next day at school, I saw Ben with that girl again. My heart thumped in sadness, and I don't even know why. Maybe I was so used to having Ben around me, and honestly, I missed him a lot. Mark soon followed my gaze over to Ben. Isn't that the dude from the ice rink? Why are you gawping at him? He was lunging toward Ben right after. I grabbed his arm trying to stop him, but he pulled me away instead to a corner. You are my girl. Remember that. In front of me was a total stranger, not the normal Mark I know. He was supposed to protect me, but now all I felt was scared. I couldn't move. Mark leaned over to kiss me, and I immediately blocked him. What? How dare you? Oh no, I'm screwed. Ah, uh, terrorizing your own girlfriend, I see. Nice. Ben? Right on time. You're so done with me. Then Mark grabbed a flower pot and charged at Ben, but I panickedly pushed him over before he could do anything with it. He stumbled about, mumbling something, when Ben's fist came out of nowhere. You, you, you want another punch? Mark waved his fist at him, but then turned around and hurried off. I stared at Ben. I couldn't believe my eyes. He was strong and protective, totally different from the soft Ben I knew all this time. Doris, I think it's time for you to go home. Have you ever wondered why your dad really did that? I, I... Ben was right, and the day's drama made me realize how much I missed Dad. I wonder how he was doing. I arrived back to find Dad sitting all alone, dozing off, amid a pile of mess. He was in stained clothes, and on the easel was an unfinished picture of... Me. With tear-stained eyes, I ran to him and held him tight. I'm so sorry for leaving. I thought I would be okay by myself, but I'm definitely not. I miss you. You're back. I miss you too, darling. I felt so bad for upsetting Dad. When I calmed down, we talked through our problems. Sweetie, I know. It's just hard. You're all I have left. I just worry you're too young to make the right decision and can't bear seeing these idiots hurt you. But Dad, I need experience to learn and grow too. Support me, will you? Um, of course. I always wish you can find a kind man who understands, supports you, and is always by your side, and makes you truly happy. All those qualities reminded me of someone. I kept chasing after trivial things out there, thus forgetting the one who was standing by me all the time. So I immediately went to find him. Hey, Ben. Oh, hey. You'll be pleased to know I've moved back in with Dad. Yeah, that is good news. Look, Ben, I'm sorry. I've been an idiot. I took you for granted, and now I feel very bad for this. I, um, was wondering if you'll take me to practice tomorrow? I'll think about it. And I didn't expect to see you confronting a tough guy like Mark. You're not just a timid arty type, are you? Who says I'm timid? I'm only like that when I'm with you, because it makes you happy. I'm actually fully capable of looking after myself. And, um, you. Hey, Bella here. The girl with the huge dreams of becoming a world-class architect. So, thanks to my boyfriend Ed, I got a job at the super prestigious Starcross Estate Company. I then found out that he was the owner's son. Because of this, some of my colleagues took an instant disliking to me. The worst of them all was this girl called Diane, who made snide comments toward me and kept on undermining my work. But then she went too far when she sent me an email telling me to break up with Ed because he loved her, not me, and she had pictures to prove it. I tried to stay calm as I clicked through the pictures she sent me. One was taken on the recent business trip they went on and was of them sitting next to each other, which obviously didn't prove anything. Another picture was of Diane resting her head on the shoulder of a shirtless man. Okay, so his build was similar to Ed's, but his face wasn't in the picture, so it could have been anyone. There were also images of text messages allegedly between them both. One message said, I don't like Bella anymore. 
I love you, Bay. But the fact that Ed used an icon in this message screen capture made me suspect that it was just fake evidence. I knew Ed never uses memes and detests slang. He always types messages out in full sentences with perfect punctuation. As I looked through the images again, I thought that if somebody else sent me this email, I might believe it. But this person was Diane. She showed her jealousy towards my relationship with Ed all the time, so she might do this just to destroy our love. I decided not to let her bother me. So I sent some pictures back to her of Ed and me happy together. Then I prepared to go home. I guessed this made her angry, as the next day, she messaged me demanding that I meet her for coffee after work. I tried ignoring her, but geez, she was so persistent. When I blocked her on social media, she bombarded me with messages via her work email. I had to agree to meet her in the end just so I could get some peace. I walked into the cafe to see her drinking a coffee and eating a muffin. She waved me over like we were friends or something, then said, You are so stubborn. Ed doesn't love you, so break up with him and move on. He likes me, not you. I glared at her. Oh yeah? So when did this so-called affair start? She pauses for ages before saying, Um, a month. No, two months ago. Okay, and how do you know he loves you? There was another long pause before she said, He tells me all the time. Duh! I told her she was being ridiculous, and she should try finding a real-life boyfriend, not making up stories about mine. As I walked out of there, she shouted after me, You'll regret this, Bella. Just you wait and see. As crazy as Diane's behavior was, it did get me thinking. There was no smoke without fire. And it was true that Ed had been acting differently around me recently. He barely had lunch with me anymore. He canceled on our date plans due to a work commitment. And then when I made dinner reservations for the two of us, he brought Jim and Ellie along too. Then the business trips became a more regular thing. They were almost every weekend and on random weekdays. Whenever he was away, he never rang me or sent me a message. His excuse was he was busy, but how hard was it to send a text? And the same this time, he was having a long business trip to New York. He went with his team, which included Ellie, and you won't believe, and Diane. Ugh! This made me even more worried. What if Diane wasn't as crazy as I thought? What if Ed really was having an affair with her, and now they had a one-month trip together? I was very anxious about all of this, but I think I would wait for Ed to come back to meet and ask him directly. It had no solid evidence, and I should believe my boyfriend, right? Anyway, we had a huge project at work, so I tried my best to suppress my worries and focus on my job. Luckily, Jim was always there to offer me advice and help me every time I struggled. Actually, he was a really great guy. And then one time, he totally saved my ass. That day, it was almost home time when my computer suddenly turned itself off and I hadn't saved my drawings. It wouldn't turn back on and I freaked out. There was a full day's unsaved work there. Ugh, how could I be so careless? I was fumbling around underneath my desk trying to fix my computer when Jim appeared and asked me, What are you doing down there? Um, I don't know what happened, but I've lost everything I've done today on the Ernest Project. He said, Let me take a look. Then we spent the next three hours trying to fix it. Luckily, Jim turned out to be good with technology, so he managed to restore all of my data. I was so thankful, then I said, Thank you so much. You must be hungry now. Would you like to go eat something? My treat for helping me. He smiled as he said, Sure. Okay, so it was too late. All the nearby restaurants were shut, so we popped into the convenience store and grabbed some instant noodles, candy bars, and coffees. But it wasn't so bad, actually. Jim smiled and told me, This was so fun. It reminds me of my college time. We both laughed. Then we talked about our hobbies and goals for the future and stuff. The next day, I finally got through to Ed. When talking to him, I still appeared to be fine, but I started to tell him more about my problems and pressures at work and said that I hoped he would come back soon because it would make me more comfortable. I expected him to reassure me and also say that he wanted to meet me too, but no! He told me that lately he was very busy with many projects and I should just ask Jim for work-related help, as he was my boss. Jim was also a close friend he trusted very much and could take care of me when he was not around. I was super disappointed with Ed's answer, so I said, Yep, Jim might be nice to me, but he's my boss, not my boyfriend. 
he didn't have any responsibility for staying by my side and protecting me like what I need from you. You've changed, Ed. You don't want to be with me anymore, do you? Bella, stop overthinking. I'm on a work trip. I'm busy. That's all. I was so mad, and I hung up and I refused to return his apology message. Then, for the rest of the week, I put all my focus into work and tried to block all things Ed-related out of my mind, but it was hard. I missed him like crazy. Then the weekend arrived, and I was relaxing with a book when I heard my doorbell. A part of me was hoping it would be Ed, only when I opened the door, I saw Jim standing there. He said, Hi, Bella. Sorry for just showing up. Ed asked me to take you out. I think he's afraid you're in stress overload with work or something. On hearing this, I didn't know whether I should feel happy or sad. So Ed did care about me, didn't he? But then, why wasn't it him at my door, not Jim? So I said, thank you, that's really nice, but I'm not really in the mood. He replied, it's no bother. In fact, I know just the place to make you feel better. You may even get some inspiration for our project. To be honest, I was kind of curious. And if it was work-related, then it would be dumb to miss out, right? To my complete surprise, he took me to the new Museum of Architecture. There were so many amazing models on display, and Jim was a great tour guide. He even led me into a room displaying a 3D model of a city hanging in the air. OMG, it was incredible. I hadn't smiled so much in, well, in a long time. Being around Jim was great, but he didn't make me feel like I wasn't good enough or make out I was overthinking things. Instead, I could relax and just be me. Afterward, we went to a wine bar and he bought me a cocktail and we sat down in this cozy booth. He smiled at me and asked, how do you feel now? I replied, much better. Thanks. And thank you for persuading me to go out. I've wanted to go to that museum for ages, but it seems Ed's always too busy to take me. Anyway, thank you. I had a great time. We started on the shots, and it wasn't long before I began to feel tipsy. The problem was that the more I drank, the more emotional I felt. And before I could stop myself, I ended up pouring my heart out to Jim. You know what? Recently, I'm not fine at all. I'm stressed at work. I'm stressed with all this Diane drama. And now, even Ed is stressing me out. He raised an eyebrow. Ed? Really? Why are you worried about him? I replied, Diane keeps telling me she's having an affair with him. She even sent some photos, but they didn't seem very legit. But these days, Ed is so different. He's so cold and flat towards me. <laughs> he couldn't even be bothered to come and see me. He sent you instead. No offense. Jim sympathetically looked at me and sighed. He didn't say anything. Then, because I'd drunk too much, I didn't think before I asked him, if Ed really betrayed me, then would you be on his side or mine? There was an awkward pause, so I laughed it off. Ignore me. I know you're Ed's friend, so of course you'll be on his side, right? But then, to my surprise, Jim answered. Hi, my name is Cammie, short for Camille, the same girl as the girl out of the TV series The Originals, and I'm 17. A few years ago, I started feeling super insecure about my appearance, and it led me to make a pretty big decision, which almost made me lose the cutest boyfriend ever. So, my two besties, Amy and Lizzie, they are so beautiful. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I'm ugly or anything, but they both have one thing that I don't have. Womanly curves. Standing next to them made me feel as flat as a plank. And you know, due to their curves, boys always notice them over me. Worse still, they even got wolf whistles and compliments from the boys, while all I received was lame jokes about my body. Talk about annoying! Hearing remarks such as, Geez, Cammy, you're so flat. I could use you as a surfboard. Or, Cammy, I think you should go back to kindergarten and grow a bit. Well, these words stung. I tried laughing it off, but on the inside, I was hurting so much. Things got even worse when Amy and Lizzie both got super cute boyfriends, but no boys were interested in me. Not only this, but my parents also getting divorced, so at this point, I felt like I had nothing left. So, I decided that I had to do something. 
During the summer vacation, I bought some bras and started stuffing them. At first, it kind of felt uncomfortable and inconvenient because the stuffing made me hot and even hard to breathe since it was summer after all, but I eventually got used to it. Then, I tried posting some photos of me in cute tops on my social media pages. The comments were all compliments from my lovely people. They said I look so pretty in my new appearance. So throughout the summer, I gradually began to stuff my bras a little bit more so it looked like my chest was naturally getting bigger. Then the first day of school arrived. It was still pretty hot outside so I decided to wear a cute top to show off my new curves. When I arrived at school, Lizzie and Amy both hugged me and told me I looked great. Although they also added in that I always had, ah, my friends were the best. Then something crazy happened. This one boy who used to tease me came over and said, Oh wow, surfboard girl. I mean, Cammy, you're looking hot. I smirked at him, then walked away. For the next year, I carried on stuffing my bras. Talk about a hassle, but it paid off as I finally felt accepted. No one teased me anymore and I didn't feel self-conscious standing next to my gorgeous besties. It wasn't all a breeze, as one day after school, it was so hot that as soon as I reached my bedroom, I immediately took the paddings off and threw them on my bed. Talk about comfortable! I went to the bathroom and when I came back, my mom was standing there holding my bras in one hand and the padding in the other. Cammy, what's going on? She asked. I turned as red as a lobster and then replied, I just feel more confident in the padding and that's all. It's no big deal. Then snatched the bra back from her hand. Mom let out a sigh. Sweetie, I know it's perfectly normal to feel insecure about your body at your age. It's up to you what you do, but I just want you to know that you're perfect just as you are. This meant so much to me, so I ran over to my mom and I gave her a big hug. Although I know that my mom was right, I just still felt more confident with my padding. Then the next summer arrived and I and my family went on a trip of a lifetime to this luxury resort in Africa. Even though my parents were divorced, they still got on great as friends, so we all went together. Okay, so stuffing a bikini top wasn't as easy as a bra, so I spent my allowance on a couple of padded bikini tops so I'd feel confident lounging by the pool. A few days into my vacation and I met this boy called Liam on the beach. OMG, he was so good looking. And you know, my padding gave me the confidence to catch his eye and soon he came over and started chatting to me. Turns out that as well as being hot, he was also very sweet. He told me that he'd been born in Africa and his aunt owned this resort and now his family stays there every summer. I also found out we're from the same country. Awesome! And so we started dating. We would sit outside and watch the sunset, horse ride on the beach and go for picnics. I had the best summer ever with him. When we came back home, we kept on dating but it was a little harder since he lived in another city. And then there was my other problem. He didn't know I padded my bras. Although we were taking things slowly, I knew he wanted to take things further. He never pressured me or anything, but I started to feel anxious during our makeout sessions. I got so down about it all. How could I possibly have a decent relationship when I was hiding this secret? I didn't know what to do anymore, and I thought my only options were to tell the truth or break up with him. Liam made me so happy, but I guess he wanted someone with curves, not some shapeless girl who was trying to be something she wasn't. That weekend, Liam would come to visit me and I knew what I needed to do, but then something happened which took the decision out of my hands. That day, I was laying on my bed when Liam suddenly barged in. OMG! As soon as I saw him, I immediately covered my breast, but it's too late! Of course I wasn't wearing my padding, so he saw me. The real me! He looked so shocked then ran out of the room. I didn't even try to run after him or explain because I knew it was too late. It turned out my mom had allowed him to come into my house as he said he wanted to surprise me. That night, he texted me and said that he didn't want to be with me anymore. Not because of my padding but because I'd lied to him. He said he couldn't be in a relationship based on lies. To my surprise, he even said he thought I looked just as pretty as always and it was my laugh, my eyes, and sweet nature that first attracted him to me. I instantly regretted lying to him. Turns out that with a padded bikini top or not, he would have approached me in the resort anyway and we would have still been in a relationship. Now it was too late. I'd lost him for good.
I knew I needed to make a change. So I ditched the padding and decided to be proud of my body. I also posted pictures of me in tops without the padding on my social media. With the caption, proud of who I am. The first day back to school was nerve wracking, but luckily for me, I had Amy and Lizzie by my side. The other kids were pointing and whispering over at me, but my friends shot them dirty looks and said to them, what are you looking at? Then to my surprise, I was applying lip gloss in the toilets when this one girl came over to me and said, you look amazing. I wish I was as confident as you. Yeah, so some of the boys started teasing me again, but you know what? I honestly didn't care. I only had Liam on my mind, so what they said didn't matter to me at all anymore. One of them even had awful acne, and the other had greasy hair, but I had better things to do than to make unnecessary remarks about this to them. So, whatever, I was over it. Now, my story isn't finished yet, as one day after school, I arrived home to find Liam standing at my doorstep with packets of nerds, which is the candy we were eating on the day we became an official couple. I was so surprised to see him there. He passed them to me and said, Cammy, I'm sorry for my initial reaction to you. I knew it was wrong of me not to think about your feelings. I should have placed myself in your shoes to understand the reason why you did that. I'm so sorry. I have the most fun when I'm with you and not having you around, well, I suppose you can say I've missed you loads. Could you please forgive me? I couldn't stop smiling as I replied, Yes, I've missed you loads too. I ran into his arms and we'd been together ever since. Naturally, Amy was a bit skeptical at first as she'd seen how upset I was when he ended it the first time. But once she met him, she realized how perfect we are together. Oh, and there's one more thing. Now I'm 17 and my body has changed and guess what? I now have an hourglass figure. I guess I was just a slow bloomer, but I got there in the end. So, the moral of my story is that everybody is great just the way they are. Yes, I know you've probably heard this a thousand times, but just try it. Stand in front of the mirror and tell yourself what makes you unique. Try to love who you are and don't be afraid to show it. Oh, and never forget that confidence is sexy. I did this and it worked. My life became the life I dreamed of. Also, be patient. Don't rush yourself and your body into something it isn't ready for. As trust me, this doesn't work. Everything comes in good time and there's always a reason for that. I now realize that I had to learn to love my body first and then step by step my life fell into place. It's me, Bella, back with the penultimate episode of my story. So, I was stuck pretending to be Ed's girlfriend, and in return, he was paying for my dad's medical treatment. I couldn't predict Jim took a flight back home sooner and appeared to be right there to see me and Ed together. I just wanted to tell Jim everything, but eventually, mine and Ed's thing was not just a one-off. I had to continue our fake relationship so he would cover my dad's medical bills. Worse still, Jim's quit his job, and I didn't even get the chance to explain myself to him. And just when I thought things couldn't get more complicated, John emailed me over a picture, and oh my god, I was not expecting to see this. I stared at the picture, dumbfounded. Ed and Ellie were kissing passionately in a car. And although their faces weren't clear, it was obviously them. I walked towards Ed's office and barged in without knocking. Ed and Ellie were there, and on seeing me, they raised their heads and looked at me with puzzled eyes. After a few minutes of silence, I calmed myself down and stammered, Why do you... How is this? You two are siblings, right? Talking was getting me nowhere. So, I showed them the photo. Ellie immediately grabbed the phone out of my hand and said worryingly, Bella, calm down. Please, listen to me. It's not what you think. I can explain. Ed stopped her and said, Are you sure we should? They looked at each other confused for a moment, and then Ellie sighed and replied, There's no other way now. My heart was beating like crazy. 
I had no idea what was going on, but I had a feeling I was about to find out. Ellie told me that it was true her mum and Ed's dad used to be in a complicated relationship. They broke up and went their separate ways years ago. Later, her mum had her and became a single mum, but Ellie knew who her dad was, and it was definitely not Mr. Stratford. Wait, what? So you guys are not siblings? I couldn't believe my ears. Yes, Ellie continued. When I was 17, my mom got sick and found out she just had a few days left. In a desperate attempt to secure my future, she told Ed's father that I was his daughter. I knew this wasn't the truth, but back then, it was the only way. Ed came to Ellie to show his encouragement. I was so mean to her at first. I hated her for being my dad's unacceptable past. So when my dad arranged for Ellie to be an intern in the company and then promoted her to be a project manager, I determined that I had to try my best to kick her out. Oh, so that was the reason. The whole time, I thought he had the same passion as me. But right from the start, his target was all about her. Ellie sat me down and said, Ed was so childish back then. As soon as he graduated, he showed up in the company as an heir took over my position, and forced me to become his assistant. This frustrated me, as I worked so hard to get the job, so I wasn't very nice to him at first. Now they were officially looking at each other with those loving eyes in front of me? Ugh! I had no choice but to listen to them till the end to find out the truth. Ed added, I could clearly see her opposition, but just to me personally, she was always professional, talking about work. So was he, Ellie continued. Over time, I realized he was not a talentless heir, but a great leader. Soon, I saw him as a man and felt for him. However, he believed I was his half-sister, so I had to keep my feelings in my heart and silently stay by his side to care for and support him. We often went on business trips and to parties together and gradually became inseparable. I turned to Ed and saw that he was looking at Ellie with a look filled with love, a look he'd never given me. So I asked, When did you two start falling in love? Ed looked awkward, held Ellie's hand, and said, It was during a business trip in Las Vegas. We'd been chatting to a lot of guests, so we drank quite a lot. Then we went back to the hotel, and she kissed me on my cheek. He turned to look at Ellie with loving eyes and continued, At first... I was shocked and pulled her up, but after she confessed her feelings for me and let me know the truth, that time I'd felt sick with worry about it all, but on finding out the truth, my feelings for her instantly became overwhelming, so... Ellie interrupted him. We spent the night together and decided to date in secret. As you know, if this was discovered, I would definitely have to leave the house and the company, so we wanted to wait until he had a foothold in the company and he could take care of me no matter what happened. I couldn't believe what happened. Las Vegas. I remembered that trip. It was Ed's business trip way back when I'd just started working at Starcross. I angrily looked at Ed and asked, So you'd been cheating on me for the entire time? Now it all made perfect sense. You were so cold and indifferent to me. Because you didn't love me at all. I was just a cover story. Right? Ed looked at me and said, I'm sorry, Bella. I never wanted to hurt you, but I couldn't tell you the truth and risk exposing my relationship with Ellie. I replied, You're selfish and unkind, and using me as a pawn in your plan was unfair. I couldn't stop shaking. This whole thing was such a mess. One thing I don't understand, though, is Diane. Where did she come into this? Ellie immediately interjected, as if to justify Ed. It wasn't like that. She's never been part of the plan. It turned out that during a business trip to New York, Diane accidentally caught Ellie and Ed dating at the mall. She was so shocked seeing them kissing, but she quickly informed on the situation and walked to them. Ed and Ellie were flummoxed being caught, but Diane just asked Ed to break up with me and officially let her take that position instead. She said that she didn't care about their dramas and just wanted to gain the reputation of being a boss's girlfriend. In fact, 
she didn't care about Ed because she already had a boyfriend. She threatened that if Ed didn't agree, then she'd expose his relationship with Ellie to the entire company that would not only destroy their dignity, but it could also risk Stafford family's public humiliation. Ellie continued, We didn't know how else to handle this, so we had to accept her request. But she also set up the drama at the hotel and called you over. Ed was forced to be part of that show-off plan. We were also tired of Diane's business. Ellie looked at Ed, then continued. Fortunately, once we captured Diane and proved that she was stealing company designs and selling them on, after that, we could end everything with Diane and told her that if she revealed our relationship, we would sue her. When Ellie finished talking, Ed turned to me and said, I know I was cruel to you, Belle, but I had to. It helped us keep this secret for a while. Then why did you come back to me and insist on fixing our feelings? I shouted angrily at Ed. The two of them looked at each other for a while. Ed explained to me that one day, when his parents were on a business trip, Ellie and he arranged to enjoy a romantic night in his room. Suddenly, his parents came back and entered without knocking. Ellie escaped in time, but Ed's mother still noticed a girl had just been in his room. At first, they thought it was Diane, and they weren't happy about it. He insisted that it wasn't Diane, but they still refused to believe him. They threatened to throw him out of the company because of it, as dating a girl who stole from them didn't set a good example to their clients. So he had to lie to them that I was his mystery girl. His parents had calmed down, but were still a bit suspicious. So they asked him to take me to their wedding anniversary party to prove that he was really with me and not Diane. Ellie said, That's why Ed had to find a way to get back with you, but you weren't making it easy. At that time, he had intended to give up, but coincidentally, we found out about your father. So I told him to take that chance in the hope that everything could be resolved. I looked Ed in the eye and said, You're a bad guy. Just to cover up your secret, you were willing to do those bad things. You treat people like puppets that you control as you please. And you even used my dad's illness to manipulate me. Did you know that it's because of you Jim left without saying goodbye? It's also because of you I no longer have a chance to honestly tell him how I feel about him. I stood there, tears in my eyes. Ellie gave me a regretful look and tried to explain. Bella, I'm so sorry. I just wanted you to go to the party with Ed so his parents wouldn't throw him out of the company. Little did I know that they really liked you and was so proud of Ed having such a clever girlfriend, so we have to keep on lying. Ed continued. It's all my fault, not Ellie's. But honestly, I didn't know that you and Jim had feelings for each other. I'm sorry. I yelled at him. Of course you didn't. You only think about yourself. I was so sick of listening to them at this point. I just wanted to get out of there and never set eyes on either of them ever again. But then Ed's phone rang. It was his mom. He answered straight away, and she firmly told him to come home at once and to bring Ellie and me with him. Whoa, what? Why me? What was going on? Hi, Ken here. I'm a breast specialist doctor. I'm trying not to be shy when I'm telling you this. It may be a bit awkward talking about my career. But because of it, or due to it, my life turns to be a drama. Well, I appreciate how hard it is for my patients to visit me. Let's face it, taking your clothes off in front of a stranger isn't easy for anyone. Yes, trust me, I've seen it all before, and it's no big deal. I'm just doing my job. I first met Gemma in my surgery. She'd found a lump and wanted me to examine it. When I checked it with my hand, this startled her, and her natural reflexes caused her to punch me in the face, and I passed out. I woke up a few minutes later to find both her and a nurse gawping down at me. My nose was still bleeding. I must have looked a right sorry state. She kept on saying sorry, but I reassured her that it was quite all right. And then with her permission, I continued with the examination. I found something, so I carried out a biopsy, and in the end, I had to tell her that she had breast cancer and needed to have a mastectomy. I could see her getting quite upset. I got used to patients' tears as they heard bad news. But this girl was so strong and brave. 
She just asked me some questions about the surgery and calmly left. Then, to my surprise, she impressed me more day by day. For the next few weeks, she brought me lunch every day. I thought she was worried I might bear a grudge for her punch or something, and this was her way of making it up to me. The food she brought was delicious, and I have to admit, seeing her was the highlight of my day. She was so kind-hearted and strong. What she was going through was horrible, but she never let it get her down. Instead, she walked over to my room with a skip in her step and a smile on her face. Soon, I fell in love with her, and I knew she felt the same way as our chemistry was obvious. But she was my patient, and I had my career to think about, so I knew I needed to be careful. Still, I couldn't seem to resist her or her cooking. I was busy at the hospital all day, so I never had time to date, while she was a martial arts instructor for kids and only worked in the evenings. So she had a lot of free time. So she cooked lunch for me every day and brought it to the hospital to eat with me. Even after her successful mastectomy, she still showed up with food. That was when I couldn't stop myself from confessing my feelings for her, and she said yes. Sometimes she had to wait many hours until I finished seeing my patients at the surgery. When she was asleep waiting for me, she looked like a little kitten. But gradually, that kitten turned into a tiger. And I soon discovered that this tigress bites. Ouch! Things were complicated talking about my duties at work. My patients are mostly female, and when I see them, I need to, um, yeah, you know what I have to do. Of course, Gemma also knows this because she's been examined many times already. She always fantasized that I would fall for another girl, one who, in her eyes, was complete. I tried reassuring her that I loved her and only her. Surgery or not, in my eyes, she was perfect. But regardless of how many times I told her this, she failed to believe me. She had a point that no girl could accept her boyfriend touching other women in their things, and even discussing that with them daily. I told her, normally the human body is a beautiful product of nature, but in the eyes of a doctor like me, it's just the same mass of meat. Would you find a chunk of meat beautiful? Isn't that shivering to think like that? Then she argued, "So in your eyes, I'm just some chunk of meat, huh?" Ugh. I tried telling her it wasn't like that, but geez, she's stubborn. It took me ages to calm her down. Every day she showed up at the hospital and glared at me as the beautiful young women came in and out of my room. Her actions hadn't gone unnoticed by the nurses. Who told me that she was making the patients feel uncomfortable with her scanning eyes and judgmental expressions? I told them it was nothing. She was just going through a hard time. That's all. And please be understanding that it was natural for her to compare herself to other women. As I told them that, I was not sure if I could stay sympathetic for her coming behaviors. That afternoon during a late lunch, Gemma asked me if the eighth girl entering my room was beautiful. Oh my Jesus! The only person I can remember was the one who walked out of the room five minutes ago. I only remembered that was the one with the cyst, but I didn't remember her face. Why do you have to think so long? Are you recalling her figure? You just need to say she's not beautiful, right? I muttered out, "Yes, right. Not beautiful at all." She frowned at me. That means you still remember her. What about her impressed you so much? I stiffened. What was wrong with women? A week later, when she brought me lunch, she asked me, "Do you and the red dress girl know each other?" As she'd been here at least three times in a row already. Every time she dresses very well. Whoever wears a red dress to the hospital, isn't it normal for patients to come see the doctor regularly? No, it's not normal. I want to see her files. The third person from the bottom up. Come on, you know I'm not allowed to do that. Then you are not allowed to eat either. Geez, this was ridiculous. She wouldn't quit though. So in the end, I gave in and showed her the records. This girl had just had breast augmentation surgery, so that was why she came to be checked so often. Gemma just grinned and said, "I knew it. Those are fake." I thought this would be the end of the matter, but it turns out it was just the beginning. Gemma bombarded me with questions about the red dress girl, such as, "Did I find her attractive?" I told her what I believed she wanted to hear. Such as she was the only girl for me, and so on. But curiously, during the following days, she stopped going to the hospital. She just texted me a few messages every day and just disappeared. Maybe I should have chosen to be a specialist in psychology, as I may have been a good doctor, 
but I had no idea what women were thinking. A month passed, and she didn't show up at the hospital at all. I was so relieved at first, but couldn't stop wondering what my sassy girl was planning to do. Meanwhile, it was strange that the red dress girl popped up more and more, even though her health was completely fine. Then one day, she turned up saying she had pain and itching. I scanned and tested her, but couldn't find the cause. Hey lady, you are healthier than me. If you are not sure, please do a checkup once a month, or I can also refer you to another hospital. Where's your girlfriend? She interrupted me. Sorry? She told me to wait and see, but I can't wait anymore. Where is she? Huh? What was going on? Just then the door opened and in barged Gemma. Oh my god. She looked like a different person. She was dressed so sexy, not cute like before. As a doctor and as her boyfriend, I immediately realized that she'd got breast implants. Before I could speak, a man stepped in and put his hand on her hip. Then he gave a confused look as he looked at the patient and immediately removed his hand from Gemma's hip. What the hell is going on here? I demanded to know. Gemma stared at the girl and said, I told you that if you continued to deliberately flirt with my boyfriend, I wouldn't leave it alone. The man who was the same age as my dad looked at Gemma. What flirting? Then he looked over at the other girl. Are you cheating on me? Then the red dress girl grinned at him and said, Who is the cheater now? What? They two were a couple or something? But what was my girlfriend doing here? Gemma turned to the man. She started it first. I have proof. I have taken pictures of the time she approached my boyfriend. If you two get divorced, you will need it. You will not want to divide your property with a wanderer, right? I shouted out, what the hell are you doing? The man looked at Gemma. You played me? You seduced me just because she flirted with your boyfriend and you wanted revenge? God, the door was still open and doctors, nurses, and patients came to see this chaos. They just pointed and thought this was a jealous scene. So it transpired that Gemma tried warning the red dress girl off me. And when that didn't work, she tracked down her husband and seduced him. And she even got breast implants for that silly plan. OMG, she was crazy. After that incident, I was severely disciplined for affecting the image of the hospital and was forced to work in a volunteer clinic in Mexico for six months without any payment. Yup. Now, I'm in Mexico to pay the price of the mistake of... No. What was my fault? I didn't do anything. So the moral of the story is, don't get involved with a patient, however good their cooking is. Trust me, it's so not worth it. Hi, it's me, Diane again. In the first part of my story, I've told you about how I found out my boyfriend, Brett, was actually my half-brother when I once brought him home to introduce him to my mom, who also wasn't even my real mom. I was seriously upset with my mom and my aunt. I loved them both so much, but they've been lying to me my whole life. Imagine how hurt I must have been. Now with the fact that my dad was also Brett's dad, of course it was wrong to keep dating him. So one day we met on our college campus and I told him I wanted to break up with him. It was so horrible to break his heart like that, but the truth would be much, much worse. Part of me really wanted to tell him because then I could meet my real parents, but then Brett would really suffer. Obviously, Brett didn't take the breakup well. He called me so many times and even came to my house begging to get me back. Even though he knew my mom didn't want him there, I completely avoided him, as I felt like if I saw him... I just want to be with him again. I ended up taking a semester off college to sort my head out. It wasn't just to avoid Brett, though. I had another reason, too. I noticed that my biological parents' company was hiring a finance intern. I discovered this when I was Googling them one day, and I realized I had to apply. Well, I got the job. I was so nervous to meet my parents, and on my very first day, my manager introduced me to my dad, I had to try and act as normal as possible, just like any other employee, but inside I was screaming, wishing that I could just tell him who I really was. A few days later, I finally met my mom. My colleague told me that sometimes she would come and bring her husband lunch, and as soon as I saw her, I started shaking. She handed my dad his lunch and gave him a peck on the cheek, and they looked so sweet together. 
I couldn't stop staring at her. And as she left, she glanced at me and smiled. Suddenly I felt so emotional, as if I'd lost something that I'd never had. I ended up running to the bathroom and crying in secret. It was just so overwhelming. When my birthday rolled around, my colleagues organized a small birthday party for me at the office. My mom and dad joined us to congratulate me and even sang happy birthday to me. I kept looking at my mom and noticed there were tears in her eyes. I knew that was because my birthday was the same date that she lost me, her only child. If only she knew I was standing there right in front of her. That night when I got home, I saw that my mom and aunt had also prepared a surprise birthday for me. It made me even more emotional because I thought back over all the years. It didn't matter how busy they both were. They always threw me a party. Inside, I felt like I was going crazy. I felt so torn between emotions for both my biological and adoptive family. I don't know why, but I decided that was the right moment to tell my mom and aunt about my decision to meet my real parents. Don't worry. I'll never leave both of you. And aunt, I'll never tell them you were the kidnapper, I said. After that, both my mom and aunt were crying and thanked me for promising not to leave them and even offered to help me get my parents back, which just made me cry too. You're probably wondering about Brett. Well, one day I was in the elevator and all of a sudden the doors opened and Brett was standing right there with my dad. I wanted to run away, but I had to face him. I quickly said, oh, hey, long time no see, Brett. I work here now. Um, what are you doing here? My dad looked at us confused, and I pretended not to know that the two of them were father and son. So he explained, Diane, this is my dad. You must have known him from working together. Dad, this is my, um, ex-girlfriend Diane. I've mentioned her to you, he said. Then my dad complimented me and said I was a great girl at work and that he was sorry it hadn't worked out for us. Brett looked at me sadly then. I told him I had work to do and rushed off. You see, I was solely focused on revealing myself to my parents and didn't want anything to distract me, but it was going to be tough now that my dad knew I was Brett's ex. But thankfully, my aunt had found out something about Ashley that I could use. That night... My aunt came to my room and told me that she'd been researching Ashley. She was afraid that Ashley would start bothering me if she found out I was trying to get back to my family. Turns out my aunt was friends with a close friend of Ashley, the same friend who helped Ashley hire my aunt to kidnap me. So my aunt met up with her to ask about Ashley, and she told my aunt that Ashley was married and had a daughter. As for her son, Brett... Ever since he was a child, she'd just given him to his dad's family, a.k.a. my parents. So, then my aunt went to Ashley's house. She spotted her going somewhere with some friends and followed her. She overheard Ashley bragging about her daughter, and then her one friend said, Oh, Ashley, you're so lucky to have two amazing kids. But Ashley just laughed and said, Oh, Brett, that boy is so stubborn. He's not like me at all. He must get his personality from his dad, whoever his dad might be. <laughs> to be honest, till this day, I still don't know and don't even bother to know. My aunt couldn't believe what she was hearing, so she asked her friend about it, and then, yes, another shocking truth came out. My dad wasn't even Brett's dad. Back then, Ashley had slept with a few random men to try and get pregnant. Then she tricked my dad into thinking the baby was his— so he'd take responsibility and divorce his wife. However, that didn't work out. But still, she kept the lie going and handed Brett over to my parents just so Brett could inherit my parents' company. OMG! Ashley was such a monster. She had fooled so many people. All I wanted was to expose her. But my aunt said we didn't have valid evidence yet. So I told my aunt I'd find a way to get some DNA samples from Brett and my dad. Firstly, I asked Brett to meet at a cafe and apologized for my ghosting behavior. I hoped he'd understand and we could be on good terms. To my complete surprise, he confessed that he was still in love with me. In my mind, I thought, I still love you too. I just wished this all would be over soon and we could get back together. As we were saying goodbye, we hugged, and I quickly grabbed a hair that had fallen on his shoulder. With my dad, I managed to find some of his facial hair on his razor in the bathroom by his office— but as I walked out, 
I saw there was a kid's drawing on his wall that was signed by Brett. It was nothing special, but it really made me feel bad. Clearly, my dad loved Brett so much and was so proud of him. I didn't want to ruin this for them. And sure enough, the DNA results were as expected. Brett was not my dad's son. But I was so hesitant to expose the truth. I worried that my parents' feelings for Brett would change. If they knew that I were their daughter and Brett wasn't actually related to them by blood, maybe they'd just abandon him. And with me and Brett's relationship, they might never accept it. So, in the end, we might all lose someone we love. A son to them, a lover to me, and a family to Brett. If I kept everything hidden, maybe Brett and I could get back together, and I could just see my parents that way. That would be so much better for everyone, right? And it was. Brett ended up joining the company too, and I could tell he wanted to get back together, so everything was going according to plan. But one day, Brett, my dad, and I were having lunch together, and Ashley stormed in. Right in front of us, she started yelling at my dad, saying that he was mistreating Brett by only giving him an intern's job. Brett quickly jumped up and explained that it was his own choice, but Ashley was furious. She shamelessly asked my dad to give her and her new family more money including school fees for her daughter. She was basically blackmailing my dad. She said that because in the past she'd handed over her son to my parents out of pity, that they'd lost their child, aka me, so she thought it was okay to demand more money from him. My dad didn't reply to her, and Brett was so angry and embarrassed by his mom's behavior, he told her to stop and basically dragged her out of there. I was almost as angry as Brett. How could Ashley do this? I quickly excused myself and left my dad there all alone. By a twist of fate, I bumped into Ashley again. After work, I went to buy some sunscreen, and when it was my turn to pay, I felt someone push me from behind. Then the person said, I'm in a rush, let me go first, I've got my money ready. And yeah, it was none other than Ashley. And the money she was holding was probably the money from my dad. Clearly, it wasn't for her daughter's school fees then. She didn't recognize me, and didn't even realize she made me drop my purse. But just before I grabbed it, she got there first. And of course there was a photo inside of me, my mom, and my aunt from when I was just a baby. As soon as she picked it up, her face changed. She seemed to realize my aunt and suddenly realized who I was. Oh my god, I never expected that I'd have to confront Ashley in this way. Would she do something bad to me now? Hi, it's me, Bella again. Do you still remember my complicated love story with Ed, who's turned out to be the son of my big boss? Thank god I found out how much of a cheating jerk he was and broke free from that relationship. But then, he again started to try hard to get me back. All the flowers and gifts must prove he still loved me, right? So I decided I was going to give him another chance. Only, before I was able to tell him this, I overheard him talking to Ellie. It was pretty clear from their conversation that he only wanted to get back with me to hide the fact that he was still with Diane. Jim overheard them talking too and he led me into the room and confronted them by saying, You two, I don't know what's going on, but I'll protect Bella. Don't you dare hurt her, or else you'll have me to answer to. On hearing him say this, I looked up at him through teary eyes. Ed and Ellie were the worst type of people, but luckily for me, Jim was the best. Right now, I felt so vulnerable, but at least his kind words made me feel like I wasn't alone. He was like a big brother that always made me feel so safe. Then he led me outside, saying, Hell with those terrible people. Let's get out of here, Belle. In a soulless state due to the shock, I followed him. He took me to the building rooftop, and it was good to breathe in some fresh air without anyone else gawping at me. We sat down, and he told me to take time to calm down, and not to worry about the report that was due in that afternoon, as it could wait. He was looking at me with such caring eyes, and he even put his hand on mine as he said, And even if you feel like taking leave today, it's okay. Um, I actually... He's so nice, but that made me feel kind of burdened, so I cut him off. Jim, thank you so much. If it wasn't for you back there, I'm sure I would have fainted in front of them. And thank you for being so understanding. But you're still my boss, and I'm still an employee. We shouldn't let my personal issues affect work. And Jim, please... He tried interrupting me with, Bella, listen, and, but Bella, but I still carried on. I'm beyond grateful, but please, next time, 
you don't have to do that, especially in the office. That will give people something to talk about again. You know how they love to gossip about me already. He kept staring down at the ground and didn't say anything else. I forced a smile and wiped my tears away. I'll be fine. I just need a few minutes alone right now. Then I'll go finish that report. Don't worry, chief. He looked at me and let out a sigh, got up, then patted me on the shoulder. Okay, great. Just so you know, I've always got your back. I'll do anything to help you forget that jerk if you want. He smiled and left. I sat there alone for a while. I don't know if it was the strong breeze making my eyes teary again, or that I'd just simply reached the peak of sorrow. Now I knew that Ed's affair with Diane wasn't just a mistake, but he really didn't love me anymore. And not only that, he clearly didn't care about me at all, else he wouldn't have been as heartless as to use me for his own sake. After that, I tried pushing my pain and heartache to one side and focusing on my work. But it was hard. I knew my colleagues were whispering nasty things about me. There were so many times when I went to make a coffee or walked into the toilets, and they'd go deadly silent and snigger in my direction. I couldn't focus on doing anything anymore, and even the simplest of jobs took me triple as long to do. It got to the point where I considered walking into Jim's office and quitting then and there. I already had my resignation email saved to my drafts. I love this job, but the people here are too toxic, and now I felt too suffocated. My career is important to me, but so is my pride. And right now, being here in this negative environment wasn't doing me any favors. And knowing Ed was so near to me, well, it made my situation even harder. Talking about Ed, obviously the flowers and gifts had stopped. He hadn't tried to contact me once since I overheard them, which says it all, really. I tried my best to avoid him. I once even hid behind the men's toilet door in a panic as I caught sight of him in the hallway which got both me and some guys in there freaked out. At that awkward moment, I thought to myself, hey, what am I doing? Why am I acting like such a coward? I realized that I had nothing to feel ashamed about. Ed was the one who treated me like dirt. He should be the one hiding, not me. I realized then and there that I shouldn't have to run away from the job I love and was good at because of a man too much of a coward to be honest with me. This was my dream job, and I will keep it. To hell with Ed. If anything, I have to stay here and show him what he missed out on. To be honest, after that unexpected and lightning moment in the meds toilets, I felt much better and ready to move on. Now I could walk past Ed with my head held high. But you know what? Each time we crossed paths, I still felt my heart ache a little. Ugh, why was this still happening? Thankfully, I had Jim around to cheer me up, and also his little brother John, who started working at the company as an intern in Ed and Ellie's project management department. Right from the first day at work, he had already impressed me, walking into the room with such a bright smile and ran right over greeting everyone, even complimented me on a design I was working on and stuff. I didn't even know that he was Jim's brother at the moment, but I already felt like I could befriend this kid. Our office needed more of this kind of positive energy. He's such a funny kid. He was always telling jokes and sending me memes. Soon, Jim, John, and me had grown pretty close, and we grabbed lunch together most days. John seemed smitten with Ellie. I mean, I couldn't blame him. She's beautiful. He sent her a coffee with a flirty note attached on it, and she took the coffee, but ripped off the note and stuck it onto John's forehead, saying, this isn't what you're supposed to say to your boss, then walked off. Ouch! The poor kid sulked for the rest of the day and kept on grumbling about how women were hard work. Then Jim got annoyed and said, Isn't what Ellie said correct? You should just stop it already. She's really not someone appropriate for you to mingle with. Jim had a point. Not only was she his boss, but dating within the company would just cause more gossip and dramas. And trust me, I knew all about that. But John is on the stubborn side, so he wouldn't give up. He continued to show his affection towards her. One time, he handed her a heart-shaped box of chocolates, and she rolled her eyes at him, then gave them out to the rest of the office. 
Ed caught sight of that and found out, and everyone could see he wasn't happy about that. I mean, she is his sister and all, so he was always giving John dirty looks and making him do all the boring jobs. One time over lunch, John was annoyed because Ed had given him a bunch of work to do over the weekend, so he said to me, Oh my god, Bella, I don't understand what you ever saw in Ed, but thank god we're all done with him now. You deserve so much better. Then he patted Jim while he was sipping on his coffee and almost caused him to choke on it, then said, See? Look at our Jim. He's nice. He's handsome. He's right in front of you. What are you waiting for? Jim quickly glared at him, then smiled at me, joking, Excuse me for my dumb little brother. I giggled. These two really had helped me through all the tough times, and I was so grateful to have them both around. But things were about to change, as Jim was assigned for a month-long overseas business trip. I can't deny that I felt kind of worried about being at work without him there. Suddenly, I felt nervous and kind of empty imagining the long month ahead. But at least I still had John. He would keep me sane. I just hoped Ed wouldn't cause me any issues, as dealing with them without Jim having my back would be tricky. The night before Jim's flight, the three of us had dinner, and John kept on pushing Jim to drive me home after that. On the drive home, I joked with him about how I actually felt nervous that he'd be absent for a while. He looked all serious, but didn't say anything back, like he was thinking something. I had to clear things up, so I said, Hey, don't worry, I'm just joking. Come on, smile for me. I won't get to see this smile for another month, right? He gave me this soft look, then said, I'll be back soon. Just wait for me. When we arrived at my front door, I wished him a safe travel, and he waved, then drove away. But as I was on the porch step, rummaging through my purse to find my door key, I suddenly felt a hand on my shoulder. Startled, I turned around to see Jim. I was stuttering. J Jim? Why? He cut me off. Don't say anything. Just listen to me first, Bella. I... I love you. Hey, it's me, Bella again. Are you curious about the next part of my story? So, before I tell you what happened next to me, just have a quick refresher. In the last episode, I got to work in Starcross Estate Company, and there's this girl called Diana, who constantly bothers me. She even said that my boyfriend Ed loved her and told me to break up with him. Of course, I'd not be fooled by her, but the fact that Ed's behavior became more and more cold to me made me feel anxious. Later on, Ed had a long business trip with Diane. Whilst I was in need of his reassurance, he still kept his coldness towards me. That's why we ended up having a big fight. Then he sent his friend Jim to take me out for the day, instead of coming round himself. I had a wonderful day with Jim, but later that night, I may have ended up drinking one too many cocktails and shots and telling Jim how upset I felt. Then I asked him whose side he'd be on if Ed ever betrayed me. Jim looked a bit awkward, but then he said, Ed's a good guy with morals, and he's mad about you. I couldn't imagine him ever looking at another girl. I drained my drink. Yeah, I know, bad idea. Then I slurred out, You have to say that. You're his best friend. You might just think I'm overthinking stuff, but you're not a girl. You don't understand how much it hurts. Jim looked at me with a firm voice. He said, I truly believe him. So I'm going to make a deal with you that if Ed ever did cheat on you, then I'd help you get your own back. At this point, I was really surprised. But then I knew that even though Jim was so certain as much, it was only due to his complete trust in Ed. So... I just shrugged it off and gave him a smile. After that, Jim took me home. He helped me to open the car door, and before I entered my house, he said, Bella, don't think too much about it at all. That night, I lay there thinking about what Jim had said to me at the bar. Maybe he was right. Maybe it was true that I was overthinking things. And also, if I kept being like this, wasn't this exactly what Diane wanted me to act like? Jeez, it seemed she was way smarter than she looked, as she got into my head. I couldn't let her win. I needed to trust in Ed. So I texted Ed. I'm sorry. I was so stressed that I blamed you. But I was wrong to do this. I miss you so much. Although it's midnight, he replied immediately saying, It's okay. I'm sorry too. I promise I'll spend more time with you. I'll be around more in two weeks. 
his words made me feel a lot better. Finally, I could rest my mind and fall asleep. The next two weeks seemed to drag on forever. I missed him so much. Okay, so he didn't call me all that much, but it was okay. He promised he'd spend more time with me soon. So I decided to trust him. Two weeks passed by. He'd fly back home on this Sunday, and I arrived at the airport to pick him up. I dressed up in a pretty dress, held a bouquet of flowers, and waited for him at the boarding gate. Normally, I hesitated to do stuff like this because I knew there'd be a company shuttle coming to pick him and his colleagues up, but I'd waited for this moment long enough. Besides, I honestly thought he'd be super excited to see me. I waited for him there for about 30 minutes, and the moment I saw him, I waved and ran over to him. But all of my excitement vanished when he just gave me a cold look. He told me there was no need to do this and that he had to go back to the company to report the work immediately so he couldn't go out with me. This made me feel so down. I almost burst into tears, but I tried to hold it back as I said I understood. As he walked off, I stood there still clutching the flowers and feeling embarrassed. Even worse, I met Diane walking behind Ed. She laughed sarcastically and said, See, I told you he doesn't love you. He loves me. He's just busy, I croaked back. There was no way I was giving her the satisfaction of thinking she had one up on me. Yeah, whatever, she rolled her eyes. You realize we have today off as the report's not due until tomorrow, so it seems to me like your boyfriend's just not into you. Diane grinned at me and walked off. At that point, I was so hurt and bewildered. I tried not to believe her, but there was no denying that Ed's reaction had been unexpected. I drove home feeling like a deflated balloon. Then I received a message from Ed. Sorry, I'm just so busy. Next Saturday is better. I'll come over to yours and we can watch a movie together. I felt excited at first, but thinking about his coldness at the airport, I felt a bit confused. Talk about hot and cold. I just didn't know where I stood with him anymore. Finally, I just texted him back. Yeah, sure. The next morning, I showed up at work, but I couldn't stop myself from trying to catch a glimpse of Ed. For the rest of the week, I kept an eye on him to see where he went, what he did, and if he met anyone strange. When he said he had to work overtime, I even called Ellie to check if he was being honest, but she confirmed this. Maybe I was being paranoid. One day, after a long working day, I felt a bit stressed, so I called Ed and said I wanted to go out with him to let off some steam. He messaged back saying that he had some family thing he couldn't get out of. I was disappointed, but I ended up going to the mall with my friend instead. We were sitting in the foyer eating donuts when I saw Ed walking into a jewelry store. This was so strange. What was he doing here? And why had he lied to me? I followed him to the front of the store and overheard him saying he needed to get a present for Ellie Stafford. Okay, so talk about a relief. So this was his family thing. Maybe today was his sister's birthday or something. But he still could have brought me along with him. Oh well, men just didn't think sometimes. Finally, Saturday arrived. Ed told me to prepare some snacks for the movie while he grabbed a quick shower. As he closed the bathroom door, I saw him leave his phone on my bed. I know it's a bad thing to do, but I couldn't stop myself from checking his private world. Maybe it's due to my worries and insecure feelings lately. I scrolled through all his old messages, but there was just a bunch of boring messages from his work colleagues. Suddenly, he opened the door and saw me using his phone. Startled, I immediately threw his phone onto the bed and jumped back. Ed looked annoyed and said, Are you checking my phone? I replied, Sorry, Ed, I just... He didn't let me finish the sentence. He angrily told me not to do it again because he didn't like to have a possessive girlfriend who wants to control his life. At this point, I was super embarrassed. Therefore, I timidly said, I just want to see pictures from your latest business trip. Oh, I prepared your favorite snacks here. Come, come here. I ran to him and pulled him over to my bed. My distraction plan seemed to work, and we had a really nice night together. As good as it was, doubts still lingered in my mind. He'd just been acting so oddly recently. To be honest, the feeling of doubting the person you love is not pleasant at all. So I decided to have a clear talk with him on our upcoming two-year anniversary. We really needed to have a frank talk. This was on Saturday night. He took me to this amazing restaurant, and the food was delicious. As great as it was, I knew I still needed to talk to him. And it was now or never. I opened my mouth to tell him how I felt when he said, It's my mom's birthday next week. 
and I'd love you to come over to my house and celebrate with my family. Oh my god, this was such a surprise. Finally, after two years, I'd get to meet the rest of his family. This proved that he really loved me and was serious about our relationship. Right? I was so happy that I said yes and gave up on talking about my worries. Then we talked a bit about what gift we should buy for his mom. Then suddenly, Ed received a phone call. He went out to answer it, and when he came back, he said an urgent job had come up and he had to leave. As much as this sucked, I forced out a smile and told him it was fine, and I could make my own way home. He said sorry, hugged me, and left in a hurry. But just a few minutes later, my phone beeped. It was a message from Diane saying, The Redmore Hotel, room 155. Come and see us for yourself, smirk face icon. This had to be just one of Diane's games, right? But it seemed so strange how she'd messaged me just after Ed had left. I peered around me. Was she here spying on me? But I couldn't see her anywhere. I needed to know the truth, so I hopped in a taxi and went to the Redmore Hotel. When I got there, I was so anxious. I stood outside of room 155 and pulled out my phone to call Ed. He didn't answer, but I heard Ed's familiar ringing sound from inside of the room. At this point, I really froze and tried one more call and still heard the ringing of the phone. Unconsciously, I banged on the door and screamed out for them to let me in. I pounded the door so hard that my hands turned red. I shouted, Open the door, you cheaters! Till my throat was sore. That moment, I didn't even know what was occupying my mind. I just knew that my heart was crushed, that I could hardly breathe, and my tears kept shedding. Moments later, the door opened, and Ed stared back at me. Have you ever questioned if your teacher hates you? I wish I didn't have to, but yep, my teacher hated my guts, and she went out of her way to make it very clear. I'm Lori, by the way. I'm 15 years old, and I guess you could say I kind of stand out because of my looks. People say I'm kind of pretty. Anyway, this year I started high school. Although I only joined halfway through the year because I was off sick for six months with glandular fever. Yep, I had the dreaded mono. I was so tired of lying in bed feeling sorry for myself. So when the doctor said I could finally go back to school, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was in store for me. On my first day, I had to show all my teachers my hospital certificate to explain why I'd missed so much of the year. When I gave it to Miss Atkin, my math teacher, she smiled and said, Welcome. Nice to see you feeling so much better. I smiled back at her and said, Thank you. And I was about to walk away when suddenly she said, Excuse me, you're Lori Hannison? Her face looked all weird, and when I told her, Yep, that was me, Something inside her changed. She gave me a cold stare and told me to go to my seat immediately. I was confused a little bit about her attitude, but then I moved on from it. The most important thing was how I could catch up with my class. After missing six months of math, I was super behind and couldn't understand anything. My mom had to hire a tutor for me, and he was such a good teacher. Only after three months, I finally caught up with them. I had a notebook from our sessions with lots of notes inside, and whenever I couldn't remember something, I'd just look at it. Well, one day, I had it on my desk at school, and Miss Atkin caught me seeing my notes. She marched towards me, grabbed it, and slammed it down in front of me. She was so angry and got right up in my face and said, Never, ever bring another teacher's notes to my class. Do you hear me? As she said that, a little bit of spit flew out of her mouth and landed on my nose. I was horrified. Why was she so angry at me? It kind of scared me, and I thought maybe she was just angry because I wasn't as good at math as everyone else. After that, I didn't dare bring my notebook to class, but sometimes I still struggled, so I'd ask my friend who sat nearby to help me. Miss Atkin always caught me asking her and would put me in detention. One time I just sneezed too loud and she gave me detention. I mean, can you even believe? It annoyed me so much that I started to rebel. I'd often fall asleep in her class and I seriously lost all motivation to do well. And that's not all. One day I wore a new dress to class and I swear I looked exactly like all the other girls at school. 
But Miss Atkin publicly embarrassed me by making me stand up in front of everyone, then said, Girls and boys, Lori is a fine example of someone who pays more attention to what she wears than to studying. Don't be like Lori. I could feel myself blushing and I wanted to cry. She was deliberately being mean to me, and I had no idea why. I was not that kind of girl. I normally loved studying, and I didn't care about clothes and shoes at all. I couldn't say anything, though, because if I spoke back to her, she'd give me a worse grade. What made it all even worse was that she was also the cheerleading coach, and she had her pack of cheerleaders following her around everywhere. One time, I was standing in the hall talking with my friend Joe. We'd been best friends since we were like three years old, and we also live in the same street, so we'd grown up together. Joe always had my back. So we were standing there chatting when Miss Atkin and some of her fave students walked by. Suddenly, I heard one of the girls say, Oh, look, surprise, surprise. It's Lori flirting with a boy again. Then one of the other girls said, Seriously, she's such a fake. I mean, she's using her illness to get attention from boys. How pathetic. I couldn't believe it. Did they think I was deaf or something? They were the ones who were fake with their thick layers of makeup and all of their gossip and drama. I didn't really care that they were saying these things, but what really got to me was the way Miss Atkin laughed along with them. I actually saw her nod her head, so she agreed with them. I knew that wasn't okay. And Joe saw it too. He was so angry and grabbed my hand and said we had to report her to the principal. I stopped him though and said, just leave it. I am still the new girl here and I don't want to cause any drama. And anyway, I have a plan. I smirked at him as I said this. So, Miss Atkin has this policy where if someone's phone rings in class, they have to answer it on speaker phone. And that policy includes her too. So that day, I pretended to bump into her as she entered the class and watched as her phone dropped out of her hands. I quickly picked it up and apologized for being so clumsy, but at the same time, I unmuted it when she wasn't looking. Easy peasy. You see, I'd arranged for Joe to call her. This was going to be hilarious. Sure enough, five minutes later, her phone started ringing loudly. Her ringtone was Beyonce's single ladies, and everyone burst out laughing. She freaked out and quickly grabbed her phone to cancel it. But Joe was persistent. He just kept calling, and everyone in class reminded her of the policy, so she had no choice but to answer it. Well, just wait for this. She answered, and suddenly Joe's voice filled the room. But he'd put on a funny accent to make himself sound older. Honey, don't forget about our secret date at our favorite hotel tonight. Miss Atkin looked like she wanted to die. She said, who is this? I don't know you. Then Joe said, come on, baby, what's up? Is your husband there? Miss Atkin was now visibly shaking and said, you've got the wrong number. But Joe wouldn't stop. Ah, uh, you're so cute. I'll see you tonight, baby. Get ready for a fun night, wink wink. At that, Miss Atkin hung up and the whole class was just deathly silent. I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from laughing. Joe had really outdone himself. However, I hadn't exactly thought it all through. Because a couple of days later, Joe and I were about to walk home when he got called into the principal's office. I went with him, but they wouldn't let me in. I could see Miss Atkin in the room along with the principal and Joe. She'd somehow found out that it was Joe who'd called her, and now the principal said that Joe would be expelled and that his parents would need to come in for a meeting the following day. Oh my god, this was all my fault. When he came out, I rushed over and started apologizing, but Joe said, Don't worry, I did it, so I'll take the responsibility. I was beside myself with guilt. I just kept saying, Joe, no, this is my fault. I'm the one who should be expelled. But Joe wouldn't even listen to me. Well, that evening, I told my parents the whole story. I was crying as I told them, and obviously they were angry, but they were also supportive. The next day, Joe's parents came for their meeting. The principal was there and the school board, and of course, Miss Atkin. Luckily, my parents arrived just in time to interrupt the meeting, and we burst into the room. We told them the truth, how I'd been so ill and had to get a tutor and that's why I carry that notebook. Then how Miss Atkin had treated me so badly and been so rude to me the whole time. I told them the phone call incident had been my fault and that Joe had just wanted to help me. Suddenly, Miss Atkin stood up and pointed at me and said, I knew it was you, you spoiled brat. You should be expelled. 
What happened next was crazy. My mom jumped up and said, how dare you speak to my daughter like that? You hate her because she's my daughter. Get over it, Angela. It's been years. Well, Miss Atkin ran towards my mom and said, you're a horrible woman. And so is your daughter. You deserve each other. She was about to grab my mom, but my dad jumped up and stopped her. I didn't understand what was happening. Everyone was so shocked. The principal looked so puzzled. Then he told us all to go home and calm down. When we got home, my mom sat me down and said, If you're being mistreated, you need to tell us. Don't suffer it out alone, okay? I told my mom I was fine and that school was great. But then my dad interrupted and said, You're fine? Don't lie to us. You were almost expelled. Then my mom said, Honey, calm down. It's not her fault. You saw her teacher. She's a demon. Then my dad just laughed and... I was so confused. Then he said, Oh yeah, Lori, we should have told you this already, but Miss Atkin was at school with us. Then they told me how the three of them had gone to high school together, and both my mom and Miss Atkin had a crush on my dad, so they became sworn enemies. They fought all the time, and Miss Atkin had been expelled from school because of my mom. Of course, my dad hadn't known all of that back then, and he'd fallen in love with my mom. Wow, now I understand the real reason Miss Atkin treated me like that. She was obviously still angry at my mom, and when she'd seen my name, she hadn't been able to control her anger anymore, and she'd just released it all on me. My mom said, Lori, you look exactly like me in high school. Because I was pretty, so many people were jealous. <laughs> Then she turned to my dad, smiled, and said, I can see that Joe is quite similar to your dad. You should be careful. At that, mom and I burst out laughing. My dad was just speechless. And guess what? It all worked out in the end. Miss Atkin got reassigned to another school, and Joe and I were only suspended from school for two weeks. Now we're closer than ever, and there's definitely some real chemistry between us. Finally, high school is getting good again, huh?